For over two centuries, New York welcomed masses into the country, but what's often overlooked is the confusing nature of the waterways surrounding Manhattan and Long Island Sound. You see, when the city was first developing as a port and trade center, one area of the surrounding waterways stood out tremendously, presenting unimaginable challenges and even dangers. The Hellgate. Today we discover its solution, the Hellgate Bridge. I'm your host Ryan Sokash and you're watching It's History. Before we get started today, I have an exciting announcement. Thanks to our sponsor, Established Titles, I officially became a lord, and you can too. Let me explain. Established Titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lords and ladies. We allow people to buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land so that they can call themselves a lord or lady. You will receive a certificate complete with a unique plot number, which gives you the exact location of your land, and it makes a great last minute gift if you'd like to make someone else into a lady or lord. So this is a fun, novel way to help preserve Scotland's picturesque woodland and biodiversity while supporting global forestation efforts. We plant a tree with every order and work with global charities, One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. What's more? Many documents actually allow you to change your title to Lady or Lord, which guarantees you the status that you deserve. You could officially include the title Lord or Lady on your credit card, slash plane tickets, slash dating profiles, etc. It makes a great last minute gift. So if you'd like to become a Lord as well, I've got a great deal for you. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking distance. Depending on how many of you want to become a Lord or Lady, we can build our own little its history kingdom. Established Titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code its history, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash its history to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Sandwiched between Manhattan and Queens are Randalls, Wards, and Blackwell's Islands. When the city was still young, to move from Ward's Island to the Bronx or Manhattan meant either taking a long roundabout trip to Randall's Island, then to the Bronx, and eventually Manhattan or Queens. The only alternative was to cross the Hellgate itself, which was a major issue. You see, the Hellgate is a unique junction of the Hudson River, New York Upper Bay, and Long Island Sound. The area is permanently cursed by churning tides too hazardous for regular small river going crafts. Before the normalization of motorboats and ferries, crossing even from Ward's Island to the Bronx was treacherous. The name was originally coined by Dutchman Adrian Block in 1614 when he crossed the strait for the first time. Between his time and the eventual construction of the Hellgate Bridge, little changed in the passage's aggressive contention. Many ships and lives were claimed by the passageway. Some sources claim that by the 1850s, one out of 50 vessels sank or grounded themselves in the strait. By the end of the decade, it was an annual average of a thousand ships running aground in the passageway. In fact, even a Royal Navy ship, the Hussar, sank in the strait during the American Revolution with almost the entire Imperial Army's payroll still aboard. Another victim in 1904 was the steamship General Slocum, which burned and sank in the waterway with over a thousand passengers who could not escape the raging fires and treacherous tides. So brought on by the endless chain of inconveniences and disasters and the simple economic pragmatism of the day, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, who owned most of the significant lesser railroad companies in New York, began their efforts to finally bridge the Hellgate. You see, moving cars by roll-on, roll-off ferries was too labor and time intensive, not to mention it was economically inefficient given the narrowness of the strait. It simply wasn't practical. On the other hand, moving trains the long way over the much narrower bridges to Randall's Island and then the Bronx was equally inefficient given the extensive detour then required to reach Queens. Hence, construction began in 1912 on the first bridge to cross the strait. 
Engineer Oliver Barnes and designer Gustav Lindenthal were commissioned by the train head of PRR, Alexander Cassatt, for the job. Cassatt had many ambitions for his company, having come out of retirement to assume the chairmanship. In his tenure, the company designed and began work on the Hudson and East River tunnels that would connect Manhattan to the grid. But to connect the smaller island was another adventure entirely. Lindenthal seemed like an odd choice for the job. Born Austrian, he had no formal education in architecture or railroad engineering. He was forced to immigrate to the USA for the sake of advancing his career. Despite his poor English, his background building railroads throughout the Austrian Empire and Switzerland helped him land a job with the Keystone company in Pittsburgh, where he would carry out a successful number of projects. After his tenure there, he founded his own consulting firm and finished another four bridges. In his role, he began his relationship with PRR, discussing the feasibility of railroad bridges across the Hudson and East River before the tunnels were formally decided upon instead. While the bridges weren't favorable for those projects, they perfectly suited the Hellgate. Lindenthal envisioned a towering suspension bridge to match with the much larger bridges along the riverway. On top of his engineering talent, he was an art lover at heart, and he yearned to create something breathtaking. This was overruled by Cassatt, who, with the rest of the company, ordered a much more practical, bow and string trussle design. Part of the tensions came down to settling complications for competing designs, considering that Ward's Island was the site of a state mental asylum and the railroad had to have a long curved turn to go around the property. It was suggested, although difficult to verify, that the steel towers at both ends of the bridge might have helped to prevent the interned from escaping. On top of the navigational needs, the boat truss required the least steel out of the three proposed designs. So designers, with the support of over 90 other engineers, set out to work. The chief assistant engineer, Othmar Amman, would later go on to build the absolutely titanic George Washington and Verrazano Narrows bridges. And if you'd like to see videos on those two projects, let me know by hitting the subscribe button. Anyhow, he later described the bridge and the significance given to it by his mentor, Lindenthal, as, quote, a monumental portal for the steamers that entered New York Harbor from Long Island Sound. He also realized that this bridge, forming a conspicuous object that can be seen from both shores of the river and from almost every elevated point in the city, should be an impressive structure. The arch, flanked by massive masonry towers, was most favorably adopted to that purpose, stating, quote, a great bridge in a great city, although primarily utilitarian in purpose, should nevertheless be a work of art to which science lends its aid. An elaborate stress sheet worked out on a purely economic and scientific basis does not make a great bridge. It is only with a broad sense for beauty and harmony, coupled with wide experience in the scientific and technical field, that a monumental bridge can be created. Fortunately, the Hellgate Bridge was evolved under such conditions, and therefore, may be said to be one of the finest creations of engineering, art, of great size that this country has ever produced. By the end of construction in 1917, the entire length of the new railroad was 16,900 feet or 3.2 miles from where the tracks met previously laid lines in Queens. However, the bridge as it stands over the waterway is much smaller at 1,107 feet. Nonetheless, at the time, it was the longest steel arched bridge in the world, using 20,000 tons of steel beams overall. In fact, it has become the first bridge in the world to use carbon steel, giving it a much stronger integrity proportional to its weight. It became the inspiration for sister bridges in the UK and Australia. However, this achievement was suppressed by the events of the First World War, just as was the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. Lindenthal and his team created a technically marvelous bridge, using construction methods and safety tests either still in development or that they had created themselves. However, Alexander Cassatt would not see the project completed. He died of heart failure in 1906, before the construction had even begun. He missed a lot. He would never see the Hudson and East River tunnels or that Hellgate Bridge. His death was not an isolated incident. Apparently, he was one of the company's many presidents to die from the stress of their work. And perhaps he had seen it coming when he temporarily retired. The legacy of these tunnels and bridge, however, 
would far outlive any other project he saw through as president of the company. Now connecting the Pennsylvania and New Haven railways, the Hellgate Bridge was an absolutely vital link for commercial and passenger trains crossing from New York to New England, seeing thousands of trains every year. It was in fact so vital to American industry and travel that 1942, after the attack on Pearl Harbor and the Nazi declaration of war against the United States, German saboteurs leapt into Operation Pastorius. And this operation, the sabotage operation, meant to disrupt the Niagara Falls hydraulic power plant, aluminum factories across the Upper East Coast, and to generally create an air of terror across the country, the German military intelligence landed two teams of four saboteurs on the East Coast. Departing U-584, the first team was instructed to destroy the Hellgate Bridge and contaminate or destroy the New York City water treatment facilities, as well as bomb Jewish-owned stores and plant explosives in the locker rooms of city train stations, simply for the value of random terror. An awfully big task for only four men of civilian backgrounds, with little training to accomplish their mission. This plan unraveled fast as the first team landed in Florida, not New York, 963 miles away from their objectives. And even if they had been closer, the other team leader had immediately alerted the U.S. Coast Guard after they had landed, getting their submarines spotted and their multiple crates of explosives quickly discovered. The mission was lost, and the FBI was on the case before the sun was up. By one o'clock the next day, the team was standing in front of a small army of police, Coast Guards, and federal investigators, kicking off the biggest manhunt in FBI history up to that point. The team split up in Jacksonville, having no idea that the mission was irreplaceably compromised, and two of the agents that actually landed in New York were already cooperating with the FBI. The FBI was keeping the lid completely sealed. No information would be announced until all eight of the men were in federal custody. Within a couple of days, all of the men were arrested and the threats were all effectively eliminated. So with such a seasoned history, what remains of that great bridge today? Unfortunately, time has not been favorable to the Hellgate Bridge. You see, after the end of World War II and the increasing presence of automobiles in New York, fewer trains were required for passengers going between the boroughs, with the same applying to freight trains. Lindenthal had actually foreseen this and after the bridge's completion proposed adding lanes for automobiles, but while these plans were initially tempting, they never went into construction. The bridge has seen a continually degrading level of freight and passenger cars every year. In 1968, Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central Railroad were ordered by the government to merge into one company in an effort to save both. Nevertheless, the dwindling returns meant this measure only lasted two years, after which the Hellgate Bridge was effectively sold to Amtrak. During Amtrak's time with the bridge, it was decided the fourth rail line was no longer needed, as traffic had simply dropped so much that the bridge had too many lanes open for each to properly be used. Hence, in 1976, Conrail made a deal with Amtrak to share control of the bridge to boost traffic in all categories. This increasing level of complication in just who controlled how much of the bridge meant its overall maintenance deteriorated. By the late 1980s, a severe refurbishment was necessary, and for that, New York could thank Senator Patrick Moynihan. Being from the area himself, Moynihan looked at the bridge with the same level of awe that its creators had. So in 1991, he convinced the Congress to allocate $55 million in restoration funds for the Hellgate Bridge. As a part of the refurbishment, Amtrak ordered a new style of protective paint. However, a flaw in the production chain meant the paint faded faster than expected, and the dull red color was renamed Hellgate Red. Amtrak, for their part, recognized the attention the new color attracted and chose to keep it in perpetuity. This refurbishment fund didn't cover everything, however. According to Antonio Molani, it was not given its due. Safety concerns still linger with the bridge. While the overall structure is sound for possibly hundreds of years with or without human maintenance, more minor components, such as the bridge's electronics for train controls are an issue. Additional concerns include lighting on and around the bridge regarding the safety of boaters and pilots lost in the night. The Hellgate Bridge is a modern marvel sitting in the background of a great city. 
At one point, it was the longest steel arch bridge in existence, and although now its ranking has changed significantly, it's still the seventh longest bridge of its type anywhere on Earth. In its time, it carried an incalculable amount of passengers and freight through the vast artery of America's largest city. Its critical flaw is its existence focusing purely on rail traffic in a time when trucks have taken over the world. And we'll leave it there for you today. Thank you all for watching. Hit that subscribe button, DM me your episode ideas on Insta, and don't miss our video about Bolivia's Great Train Cemetery. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.